my friends, welcome, and here we are again on another episode of Just Another Kill Team Podcast, where we bring someone else's local scene to you. Today, we're talking about New York. Um, you know, of course, we've got Travis from New York and a couple additional guests. This week, we've got the rest parts of my team, the Brooklyn Rats. Hi there. Hey. With, with uh, Layla and George, two of my teammates from the beginning of the edition, where we took down the first Kill Team Open. They've been instrumental in helping the New York scene spin up our small tournament scene and the New York Open. Hi, thanks so much for having us here today. Yes, thanks for coming on. Our pleasure. So what are we going to talk about first? We've got, um, we've got some exciting stuff when it comes to like the, 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 the local scene and, and some of our bigger events. Do we, Travis, yeah. do, you want to, do you want to do an announcement? Should we jump straight into that? Yeah, let's kick it off. We have have our dates locked up for the second New York Open. It'll be November 4th through 5th. Find out more information at ny-open.com. We'll have that. We'll have tickets up uh, by the time this podcast drops on Monday. And uh, Layla will be heading the TO scene again. And me and George will be working on the narrative. Nice. How many tickets do you have? Our goal is to maybe do double the numbers from last year. So we're hoping to get maybe 100 people out throughout the course of the weekend. We'll see if we can hit those numbers, but that's the goal. That's a great goal. Yeah, that's very exciting. And in Kill Team news, we've had a couple things coming up. By the time this is recorded, KCO will have already happened, so that should be interesting. And <clears throat> to that end, Beastman and Votan had a little bit of a rata, so we could talk about that a little bit for Kill Team news. And interestingly enough, George here has been painting some custom Brooklyn Rats Beastmen. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, no, I'm loving, I'm loving the Beastmen. Um, I think. It's a really interesting team in terms of the hobby aspect because it seems like no one managed to actually get their hands on that box set, which means everyone's having to build their own kind of versions of, of the Beastman team. So I've gone for a Skaven, Space Skaven kind of theme, which neatly fits into our, um, into, into our own Brooklyn Rats, you know, team theme. Um, so that that feels great and I'm having the best time ever because Skaven were my uh, army when I was a kid playing fantasy. So getting back to into the kind of some of the classic models, I've actually kind of gone and, and, and found some me metal models um, from back in the day to come and join my kill team and, and repainting them from, uh, from the past. Like it's, it's all heavy nostalgia. So um, I'm loving that. And I'm seeing a load of really interesting conversions all over the internet from like Storus warriors to like weird mixes of, of kind of chaos spawn and ancient ghost things. Like it's just like everyone's gone, gone wild with the creativity. So that's great. But um, yeah, it's, yeah. So, so I'm, I'm happy. We can talk about rules as well. Like they've definitely, caused a stir online with, with the rules as well. Yeah, there's definitely a lot to talk about there. One of the, the cool ideas that I saw for proxy slash conversions, um, I didn't see anyone do it yet, but I heard people talking about converting the corn jackals into beastmen. I was like, dang, I would totally do that. If I, I wasn't part yes. of that idea to Layla, actually. Ooh. So I'm not working on it for beastmen, but I do have a project in the works for uh, actually the Chaos Cult. I think a lot of these recent boxes, just because there haven't really been enough copies to satisfy demand, it's been kind of like kit basher heaven. But I'm currently working on a set for uh, making a chaos cult with jackals who are going to be mutating into berserkers who will be mutating into eight bound. I love that. Yeah, that's going to be great. Layla, have you played uh any games as or against the beastmen no. <laughs> i've been out of the game for a quick little minute i've had trouble getting my games in recently well i've i've i'm a few games games in and and um and i think it's interesting I, travis and i have played against each other and travis you've played some other beastmen players as well when it comes to the new errata change uh, how do you feel i think just clarifying that just for those listening, if you didn't, didn't catch it before, they, 
uh, Games Workshop put out an errata that, that just clarifies that when you initially kind of take the Belgor Ravages down to zero wounds, they count as being incapacitated for the, for the sake of like scoring in most cases. Uh, I think that was a good and, and makes a lot of sense. I think there are some people who think that there are more nerfs or changes that the Beastmen need. What do you think, Travis? Uh, I think we, I'm personally fine with the incapacitation ruling for Frenzy. So for people who don't know, when the Beastmen were released, if they were incapacitated, they did not incapacitate and they frenzied instead, which is like this alternate version of events. And the update has made it so that for teams that need incapacitation to trigger rules, like Hand of the Archon, who need pain tokens, or other incapacitation-specific rules around tech ops, it now counts when you take them down to zero wounds the first time, not when they're in frenzy state and you kill them in melee. So I think it's a it makes them easier to deal with. It unnerfs them because I think for teams that were seek and destroy centric, beastmen were basically like a no go, uh, just because you couldn't score particularly well. So I think it it's a nice change. Yeah. So like another example there would be like for headhunter, like you just get them down to zero and you don't have to wait. Just like another yep. specific context there. Yeah. It just makes things much easier. It's easier to understand too. I think having it did like. By rules as written, you 100% weren't incapacitated because you are you can be incapacitated in the frenzy state specifically. So I think it's a nice little bit of rules cleaning. If they had intended it, it definitely wasn't written that way. So it's nice to have that clarification. Uh, on top of like the Votan errata, which is a little bit stranger, where the beam weapon was written in a somewhat confusing way on what a beam line counted as for the Votan plasma beamer. That's a 4-6 AP2 that makes a beam line. Uh, interestingly enough, they changed it so it doesn't hit the original target, even though I think the wording in the book definitely calls out that everyone on that beam line gets hit. So that is a, it was both a nerf and a clarification. So that was interesting. But it does, the beam line now also extends past. So it's kind of a weird mix on it where yeah. you have the option to get way more targets. However... Yeah. Yeah, but now you can't stack like two grudge tokens on someone and just beam an extra 2d3 wounds, which I think is a little weird because it's definitely not written that way. But clarifying is good. And both of these things were clarified, I think, because Kansas City Open happened, is happening this weekend. So the TOs wanted some of the more questionable rules to be dealt with. As far as, you know, you know, Layla, you mentioned that you haven't been in the game super recently, but you do have some good operative knowledge maybe for our current operative showdown around the Corsairs, your primary love, I think, in the most last couple of months? Yeah, uh, I've had a pretty good run with Corsairs for a minute. Um, yeah. They were my team for the most recent Kill Team Open. Uh, I love them dearly as long as it's in as long as we're playing inside. Um, and I definitely have some thoughts on this little uh, showdown. Wonderful. On that note, let's officially kick off the portion of the podcast, the Operative Showdown. Operative Showdown. Yeah, so in Operative Showdown, we like to compare and contrast a handful of models from a specific team. Since you're the Corsair specialist here, I have the Shade Runner versus the Psyker up against each other. If you could only pick one going into a matchup, which one are you going to do? Where are the strengths? Where are the weaknesses? And do you have any like fun stories around the, the models? Absolutely, yeah. So uh, in terms of only picking one, the critical part here is that like I don't know what else I'm bringing to the table. So if it's in the context of the full team and what you're bringing there, it's the Psyker by a mile. And the reason for that is uh, the ability to swap models is really what unlocks the mobility of the team. Uh, there are other teams that are incredibly fast. Pathfinders is probably one of the best examples but nothing touches the sheer maneuverability of the uh, nothing touches the sheer maneuverability of the Corsairs because of the ability to swap models in place. It unlocks about nine more inches of movement, including a couple of other tricks that they have in place. And that's what really makes that team just move very quickly. However, if it's just a single model in play, Nothing beats the Shade Runner. It's the most valuable operative on that team by a mile. Um, it can do 
a lot of actions, especially indoors, that make it near impossible to overvalue. Um, the reason for that is the ability to cause harm while moving, as well as having a silent weapon. Uh, you add that in with uh, some of the free actions and extra APL, then you're starting to see the Shade Runner be able to kind of clear out entire rooms on her own, as well as making plays that no other models in the game can do. Um, in terms of like one of the things that kind of demonstrates that, and a fun little story, so when you're playing inside, the Shade Runner gets a couple of extra things added to her kit. Uh, one of them is that the Light Fingers ploy allows her to open doors for free. That's fantastic, and obviously, I think everyone's aware at this point how good Light Fingers works inside. But one of the things that I think is really good to keep in mind is how that interacts as well with hatchway fighting, which you don't have to be on engage to do because you're not charging. So the Shade Runner specifically can start flying through rooms while on conceal, opening doors for free, fighting with pretty good melee stats, be striking people as she's doing so, which is going to allow her to start winning more engagements because they've already taken five damage before it even starts, as well as having a silent weapon for finishing things off after. And she can do all of that while on conceal, stealing points, things like that. Yeah, that's very potent. I've never like heard it pointed out so clearly. That's great. Um, so also, when it comes to the Psyker and like the combos there, is there any like automatic go-to combo that you like to bake in with the Psyker, like swap places with uh, the Shade Runner or someone else or anything like that? Yeah, I mean, it depends on what you're trying to set up. Um, the most obvious things that you can do, especially on open, is use the Psyker to mitigate the heavy penalty on the Fate Dealer. So that'll let you get her up onto a vantage point without her even having to dash. But there's a lot of other options available to you. So you can start to do uh, things like moving a, uh, a gunner into a different place to get a new angle that the opponent hadn't even considered. And then they have to start answering that. This also works with the heavy gunner, um, but especially for you know blast threats. Uh, so much of this game involves trying to deploy things so that they're still in cover, but avoiding that blast range. And once you start getting the ability to make that blast range, well, anywhere that's within, currently anything that's within 15 inches of where the gunner is could really start to be the uh, target. Then that really opens up the play for, there is no safe places for your opponent to put anything within two inches of each other. So there's a lot of play there. Um, the other main thing with the Psyker is the freezing grasp really takes away their ability to kind of escape that kind of punishment. So, so you're saying it's mostly like a situational watch out for things tools and there isn't really like a, a straight up always do this combo kind of thing? No, I mean, I, I think the nice thing with the Corsairs is, you know, you don't have a ton of flexibility in what you're bringing. You're essentially, I, I really only bring the same nine models most of the time with really the only change being whether the gunner has the blaster or shredder. And I think with the recent addition of rending, it's almost always going to be the shredder uh, with the exception of a couple of power armor teams. But in terms of uh, what the Corsairs allow you to do is to really answer what the opponent is doing on the board. And that's what things like the uh, teleport and freezing grasp allow you to do, is to start reading the situation and say, well, I'll get a win condition if this model is now 15 inches over this way. Yeah, that's great. It's a good, insightful comment. And you've gotten lots of usage out of the Corsairs in our local tournament scene, right? Yeah, I mean, so like I said, I mostly like playing them indoors. On open, it can just be a little bit run away, which isn't necessarily my preferred play style. Um, but I am a elf appreciator, and uh, so I do like to bring the Corsairs or Compendium Craft World to a tournament from time to time. That's true. I remember that you brought Craft World relatively early on, I think in June of last year when we still had the, uh, the five grenade spam legal. Yes, that was to last ACO. Um, you could bring five plasma grenades, and if you want to talk about blast threats, this is you know, still full six-inch indirect range. You have five grenades. 
And most people at that point in time, the most common teams were uh, Vetguard, Wormblade, and uh, Pathfinders, all of which really hate Blast, Indirect, and attaching those things to a model with a nine inch move after the fleet ploy. So that was very fun. Um, probably best for the game that five grenades is banned, but you really can ruin a horde's day with uh, the five blast grenades. Yeah, I mean, blast grenades are real rough, and having access to a million of them was definitely uh, very rough. You know, as a tournament scene in Brooklyn, we've, you know, had like a year and a half to develop the scene. Do you still find that like our local players are still getting hit by blasts a lot? Do you think that you know a year and a half of practice has let the regulars really learn how to avoid the worst of blast techniques? And that goes to you know, both you and George, because you know both of you have been in the scene with me for the last like year and a half playing games at these tournaments. Well, let me tell you a story about a trip that we took down to see our friends um, <laughs> in. Uh, and around the DC area recently, where Leila and I were on a team. And um, it doesn't matter how long you've been playing. Sometimes you forget to distance your models and you get punished. And I am afraid and ashamed to admit that I screwed up our chances of winning that tournament uh, by bunching up all my one blade models and getting, getting hit by a grenade, like, multiple times. So, no. This is your answer. No, they haven't, and we haven't learned. We're still, they're still getting hit by the occasional grenade. But um... yeah, <laughs> I think you a... get better about it, and you really learn to feel shame for it. Like it's at the end of every round of a tournament, there's still someone, regardless of how long they've been playing. Some of these day one people, you still see them kind of walk away from a table with their head down a little bit, and you ask what happened, and they just said, "Got caught in a blast." Yeah, look, the thing that's been really interesting is is jumping um, from into the dark back to open uh, and changing teams. And uh, I think when, when I did that, I forgot some of the perils of like being uh, on an open board and, and setting up, uh, you know, poorly. It's just you, you completely forget. Um, <laughs> about that when you spend six months kind of in the dark and, and prepping for into the dark tournaments and things. Um, so that's always, that's always something that I think is, is worth bearing in mind that you know, switching environments really does mean that you need to change how you, how you play these, these teams and, and set up and all the rest. So maybe it was that that, that got me. Yeah, in general, I feel like people are still getting hit with Blast a lot. Like, I've gotten hit by Blast recently, even though, uh, you know, uh, all this time of playing, like, you learn, but apparently not enough. But actually, it's not even just, like, you can learn to avoid it. It's it's like, if you're playing a Horde team, it's a small board, there's not a lot of places to hide. You think you're safe, someone's got a crazy trick, you get blasted. So, this is a great segue, I think, into something that Travis and Layla do really well when they're organizing our, our events, which is setting up boards so that people aren't um, forced to deploy badly. Like, so the way that the terrain is set up really can like screw you if, if it's done, done poorly and you're a whole team and you, you, you realize, oh, 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 I'm going to have to bunch in order for my, my guys to get any sort of attempt at like a, a save. And um, I, th I think one thing that Travis and, and Layla have done really well is is ensure that boards are balanced and enable like people to be able to like actually get through the first turn without having their team blasted away. Um, so maybe you know how much effort do you put into that specific problem that you know it's the setup and, and the deployment zones when you're making these boards? Yeah, I mean I think. I would say I definitely follow Trav's lead on this. I mean, inside of our first tournament, we really started to see like a lot of questions of obscurity and things like that come up because he was really starting to design boards around there isn't safe deployment, but you can find good deployment. Um, and so I, I, I follow your lead a lot on that. So definitely if you have insights to share on that, I think that'd be valuable. Yeah, I think 
I always ended up designing boards that I felt like I would enjoy playing on. So one of the big things that I think people do is make symmetrical boards. And I don't actually think symmetrical boards do a good job of helping players learn the whole game. So part of our push when we were making the scene was to set up boards where people could learn lessons on each board, whether that be a board where I put terrain a little bit closer. So there's like jumping pathways or there's going to be a lot of mid-board obscuring terrain so that you have to learn how to use obscurity. I think those things definitely helped give players new skills. Um, and, you know, to the scene's credit, you know, George and Layla and everyone else in the Rats and everyone else in Brooklyn that comes to play, they all do a really good job of helping the new players um, learn their lessons, whether or not, I don't know, you know, I don't get to play in my tournaments, so I don't know how Layla and George interact with the newer players when they play them, so... Maybe you guys have uh, fun stories or, you know, teaching moments that you've bumped into in tournaments. Oh, I, I think it's really, um, it's really fun to have people come uh, to these tournaments when you know, that, that they've only played a handful of, of games. And the general community is really open um, on, on our Discord channel for the, for the shop that we play at. Like, people are always offering to to teach people and, and help them kind of get the rules, get, get comfortable with the rules before they attend a tournament. So we see a lot of general, you know, people from within the community doing, helping, helping newcomers prep. But when they actually make it to a tournament, um, they're going to lose a lot. And so what is really nice, though, is to see people at the end of the day, um, you know, with a huge smile on their face, having one, maybe one game, but, but often like none. Um, I think that's like that's really that's really great to see, and I think this is a testament to like the friendliness of the of the whole environment and everyone there. Um, and then in terms of like, so yeah, if you're well, I don't know if you're a tournament organizer, it's important to make sure that you know you're you support those people by like acknowledging the fact that that they're there and maybe kind of you know hanging out at the table and um and patting them on the back a bit and making them feel good about the fact that they've they're learning as they play because as we like to say and this is so true playing games at tournaments is one of the best ways to improve um especially if you're playing against someone who's really good like new players should be excited about going to tournaments where there are world-class players because you get to play against world-class players like it's 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 great you'll you know Travis regularly beats me, uh, and uh, uh, the silver lining there is that I'm usually learning something while I'm doing it. Um, so, yeah, I think, and then and then just re reminding everyone else who's in the room to be to be kind uh, and to have fun. Like if you're winning against someone who's only had a couple of games before, like have fun with them and make it a good experience. Uh, so that's the general advice to the players and the, the TOs that I can think of. Yeah, that's a great point. I'm um, honestly just overall, one thing that I've been really impressed with the Kill Team community is generally it's had better sportsmanship than a lot of other games that I've seen and played. So big uh, shout out to y'all. The I'm assuming if you're listening, you're part of the community of good sportsmanship. And if you need a little help there, we're here to help you. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the big values of playing a game like this over, you know, playing a video game is the person across the table. And so I think regardless of how competitive you are, you have to be thinking about them as well and really trying to make sure that they are also having a good time because otherwise just go play with pixels. Yeah. And I think there are like tactical things that maybe we could uh, we could help players do that that make for a better game like i think we've talked about intent and how important like being clear with your opponent is and by doing that to someone who's new to the game new to the scene like they learn that that's a that's a good way to play um as well so um and sometimes if someone you know you can help that other player like clarify their own intent by asking hey is this what you intend um and and maybe they they're not sure and you can kind of help them make the move that makes the most sense for them. Um, you know, you don't have to do yourself like a 
you either have to play against yourself or play for them. But I think that kind of stuff really helps foster a, like a, a good a good vibe and a good scene and essentially like good manners. Yeah, especially um, for any new players who want to try coming to a tournament. Definitely ask for help when you're at if and let the person, the TO know that you're new to the game because people will definitely go the extra mile to help you because going to a tournament is very stressful for a first thing for a lot of people and asking for help, there's nothing wrong with that. And that's definitely been a big part of our local scene. I know that when Layla is TO, she gets a lot of questions and it's always our job to kind of help. <laughs> Were there any um, stories that that you remember, Layla, about like teaching new players? Were there any things that you found like useful when to like when we were spinning up the scene, maybe like a year ago? Yeah, I mean, wait, quick vape moment. You know what? Maybe I'll jump in for a second to say uh, for anyone that's listening that is thinking about going to a tournament but hasn't yet, you should definitely do it. Generally, the whole game is pretty chill with new people because everyone's pretty new to the game because the game is new. Yeah. There is yeah. no shortage of new players. So Absolutely. And I would I'd go further than that. The Brooklyn Rats, we met at a tournament and we uh became friends through trainings that go to a to the first like uh, KO, the kill team open that, that we went to together. So it's not just fun, like it's a great way to meet friends and, and I think you know, occasionally like new lifelong friends like I, I, it's uh it's it's funny it's, it really is like not just more social than a video game but like a real a really good way to to meet like-minded people and, and hang out so true yeah i mean in terms of like talking about the ability to make friends inside of this game we recently attended one of our teammates weddings and it's hard to like parse that point from you know meeting at a tournament and just being like, oh, what are you playing? But we did get there over, you know, a year and a half of time and working together on all these projects and everything like that. So always developing the scene um, because the scene makes friends. And yeah. Yeah, that's so true. So it's the, the question for me was, what was it? It was... Did you have any, um, like, common things that you did when we were spinning up the scene like a year ago? Because you handled a handful of our earlier tournaments outside of the ones that I did, so... Any like any tip tips or hints for uh, anyone who might want to start their own tournament or things that you found useful in that time period? Yeah, so I really found, especially when starting, was uh, to read the rules and keep an open mind about them. Um, I think it's especially as you're getting started and if you're a early TO, it can be really tempting to just go based off of like how you're pretty sure it works. Um, I try to make my policy for any time I'm TOing. If somebody asks me a question, I say, I'm pretty sure that it's this, give me one moment, and then I look it up as quickly as I can. Um, because actually trying to like keep that in mind and explaining your decisions to people will help them understand why those rules interact that way. And it also encourages your players to actually be looking at their own rules and reading those interactions and checking them by themselves. It's so really having like those conversations and not just sticking to this is definitely what it is will help develop your scene as, you know, then you have 10 rules lawyers in a room rather than one, but hopefully you're collaborative. Yeah, that's great. That's amazing. I've got the the blessing of one of the, one of the players here is just like every single time he's been to an event that I've ran, he's taught everyone, including me in the room, like something that we had all missed and like it doesn't matter how long the game has been out that's always true so shout out to my guy jamie that's always crushing it with the rules yeah and if oh yeah jamie we love rules lawyers rules lawyers make the scene go around you know on discords throughout the kill team universe uh we have lots and lots of rules lawyering yes but like with any good like uh, legal system ultimately there's a judge and if your lawyers do not like back down when the judge makes their judgment then you've got problems so i guess as a to that you know you need to have the authority to be like okay interesting conversation everyone this is what i'm saying i'm the to this is what happens otherwise it descends into chaos which is no I think, fun 
I think another important thing as a TO is you have to be willing to acknowledge that you make mistakes. So one of the things that I definitely do when we make rulings is like, this is what I think it's going to be. I'm going to look up the rules. This is what it looks like from the rules. If it turns out that later on I made a mistake, I'm sorry, but we're doing the best we can on a short time frame. And I think that's one thing that uh, just because you're the TO doesn't mean that you're always right, but it does mean that your say is final in a tournament setting. Whether or not it actually turns out you're right, at the end of the day, you can make mistakes. Everyone makes mistakes. And that's a really important part of building up a scene is being willing to make mistakes. Yeah, that's honestly so true and so valuable. So once again, for anyone that's like an aspiring TO, just know that like there's not the weight of the world on your shoulders. You can totally make mistakes and it's fine. And like I do that all the time, too, where like I'll make a ruling and I'm like, you know what? This we might find out tomorrow that this isn't right. But for now, we've got to keep it moving. So this is the ruling. And then we can have like a running FAQ that like we can reference for for situations like this in the future. It's definitely Those happened. are fairly rare, though, right? They don't happen all the time. A lot of the time as a TO, you're, you're mostly there to just be that referee if two people are arguing about a, a measurement or obscurity in line of sight, right? I, I think right now with the advent of four teams in one month, there are a lot more question marks in the scene than there would be mm. in a normal, like maybe in you know all of April. There are probably far <laughs> fewer of these kinds of niche situations and question marks floating around. But right now, with uh, you know the most recent errata clarifying the beam interaction, which ended up coming out basically like none of the interpretations, um, just I think for instance, in this specific thing, Votan have a plasma beam gun. It will deal damage to one target, and then if you get a critical, it applies a beam line that everyone takes damage on. If you read the rule, it's not clear where the beam cuts off, or how far it goes, or who gets hit. And then the errata, basically, there were three camps. One that said the beam started at the original target and went behind it. One that said it started at your gun and went to the target. And then one that said the beam is an infinitely long line that hits everything. Uh, but none of the interpretations would have landed on the original target doesn't take damage. But that is the, the So now we have everyone on a line takes damage except for the original target. So... There's a lot more questions right now. I think cults and um, Inquisition both throw a lot of question marks into the air of what is or is not allowed. I've seen, I believe Kansas City will have four rulings around chaos cults, if I remember correctly. So, yeah, there are there are a lot of question marks, I think. Hmm. Yeah, because I believe that there is a... There are four... From what I understand, there's four changes for... Um, the Ashes of Faith box for Kansas City because Kansas City is going to allow those teams into play, along with the Atlantic City Open later this month. Uh, Both so, of those are pretty strange teams that definitely open up a lot of questions as well. Oh, yeah. So, you know, as a budding TO, know that you are not alone in making those mistakes. Um, for any players who get upset because of those rulings happen, at the end of the day, the game has a lot of fuzzy edges, unfortunately. GW does not write extremely, extremely concise rules or very clear rules with a lot of explanations. So just know that everyone is trying their best and no one is trying to, like, screw you out of a game. <laughs> I think is a, an important part of building up your scene. Um... Speaking of growing your scenes, we've got our own little Discord and Patreon <laughs> we've been working on throughout the course of this, this last month, Jason? That sounds about right. Yeah, we've got a little community of tournament organizers and people who are fans of the show, and we're talking about things we could add to the show and trying to find new guests. So if you are listening and you want to chat with us or bring on your favorite local TO, We'd love to hear from them. That's true. It's kind of like, it's like the cooler way to make a comment. I mean, feel free to make comments. And also, while we're, while we're at it, leave five-star reviews. But also, if you want to just, like, have a full-blown conversation, hop in the Discord, strike up a conversation, and uh, you can definitely find us there, and we'll chat. Yeah, in fact, it, next, week's, uh, next week's podcast, people that we met on Discord. It's true. So that'll be a fun treat. Um. As far as looking at the new teams, do either of you have any things that you're scared of or uh, looking forward to do with them? I know, Layla, you mentioned that you are looking at making a 
corn style cult. Is there any set of plays that you're really excited about doing in our niche tactics segment? That's right, listeners. You know what time it is. It is time for niche tactics. Niche tactics. Yeah, I mean, like I said, I'm I've had a bit of trouble getting in games recently. Um, silly mistake on my part, but definitely the cult kind of just calls to me a little bit. Uh, just the sheer level of violence there is just kind of entertaining. I think also the cult seems to play a lot on um, if things start to go even a little bit bad for your opponent, then they go really bad. And I do kind of like those punishment type teams. So it's like you you failed a single melee. And not only am I going to heal back all of my wounds, you're now in combat with a much scarier thing. Just because, you know, you ended up with one less dice than you needed to kill. So I do kind of like that type of team that's just, I'm going to play off of your bad luck. That seems kind yeah. of like, uh, similar to your old Novitiates team, where if you had good luck or just a spot of normal luck, you could ramp it up to extremely good luck, right? Exactly, yeah. I, I do kind of like those uh, probability type teams and everything like that. Um, I, I definitely need to like spend more time in the rules to really get a full grasp on uh, both how I'm going to be kit bashing them, since the Dark Commune doesn't really have a direct World Eaters equivalent. Um, as well as just like all of the options inside of their play style. But I think, um, you know, that level of board control with that many models combined with that level of sustain just from potentially healing up to 12 wins uh, at any given time, including just in the strategy phase. Uh, I think there's a lot of options there for really creating something um, that's just terrifying. To play against. I think the other thing uh, I quite like about them is that they are sort of unpredictable in a way. So you know what they're going to do, but you don't know when they're going to do it. So, for example, like you have all of these models and, and, and they're all potential mutants and, and, and these horrible bombs, but like you don't know exactly when and where the threat is coming from as an opponent. And that's quite powerful. I think a lot of this game is about being able to predict and react to what your opponent is going to do. Um, and if you have 10, uh, 10 models that could, could be the point at which you see this, uh, this sort of mutation occur, uh, that's, that's really difficult to predict. Um, I don't know. Do you, do you feel the same way or will they end up? Well, do you think do you think it'd be obvious what a cult player is actually doing? I mean, I think there's going to be some amount of it that will be obvious, but also at the same time, yeah, it's really what you said, which is that it just opens up options for you. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the more options you have, you know, the the stronger game plan will be. So even though it there the cultists are kind of fragile models, um, you've got ten of them. And all of them could be threat pieces. You know, if you go against that guard, you can target their order structure or their gunners, and they'll start to fall apart a little bit. Um, if you go against the cult, you've got 10 models, all of which could really wreck your day. And you don't know which of them it's going to be quite yet. So I do like that kind of, like, spread threat. Yeah. And... Do they start with being GA2 models, the, the basic cultists, right? When they That's and when they mutate, do they become GA1? Correct. So you have so you, uh, you start with 15 activations, and I think on turn one you can break it down into uh, 12 activations. Right. Because each mutant, so there's two activation windows on turn one. Uh, one during your strategy phase and one for your leader. So both of those can split out uh, into a GA2 pair into mm -hmm. two sets of GA1. So you can have uh, 12 activations, which is potentially very, very powerful for anyone who hasn't uh, played a ton. Um, I do think that, you know, for players who are worried about the Chaos Cults, 
one of the big things that you have to realize is the devotees are the only things that can turn into torments. So your job is to be very aggressive on the opening turns. They don't have a lot of long range threat. They really, they really don't. So it's up to you to start on engage and start shooting, start meleeing as soon as possible. Because any devotee that dies is one problem that you don't have to deal with. Granted, there is a little bit of fear where if you send a kind of middling melee model, you could get a mutant in your uh, in your midline before you expect it. But on open, you know, use your shooting very actively because. That you can definitely kill the models before they are super dangerous. Yeah, I definitely think with like the move back to open and everything, this team seems very good. It does not seem like fully cracked. Um, it does just kind of pose, you know, a significant problem, and you have to figure out how you're going to solve that problem. Which is like, how do you deal with that many threats on the board? Yeah. Um, For for players who don't know, it does seem like GW is kind of moving us a little bit towards more open boards at their large tournaments. Um, it just like from what I understand, Kansas City is going to be all open, and I've heard that other events might follow suit. So without in the dark, um, you know, those turn one shooting actions are going to be very very important for dealing with the cult. Um, as far as the Inquisition. You know, there's some cool tactics that people can use on there. A lot of them kind of surround their secondary choices. I don't know if either of you have thought about it, but I know people are really worried about the supreme authority where players can stop your uh, strategic ploys from going off. But if that is the case and you know it's going to happen, at least you can plan around it for most teams. Uh, for instance, you know, if a vet guard tries to issue an order, I. Are do you guys know if veteran guard stra uh, orders count as strat ploys? I don't no, actually know if those can not. be canceled. Yeah, I don't think those can be canceled. Yeah, won't be able to cancel those. Um, but there are so things like omni scramble and things like that will still be able to go through. Um, but some of those kind of like critical orders they won't yeah. be able. To. So it's a matter of just kind of timing out what you're willing to get canceled. Um, it kind of adds on another layer to that like what order are you doing your strat ploys in and why. Um, that I think we're starting to see a lot more of that come into, that kind of like metagame is mm. coming in. Um, and it's been that way since uh, Hand of the Archon introduced the uh, gaining a command point for stalling is mm. when I realized like a lot of people who aren't playing competitively were only just starting to realize how the sequencing of strat ploys work. Yeah, there is a concept in, I think, Magic the Gathering where you are delaying your most important spells through counter magic. So you send a kind of like a, a teaser to like go out. So like, this is probably the one that I expect to see it around uh, like legionaries because you get two ploys, right? Um, one of them is probably going to be the lower value spell. One of them is probably going to be the higher value strategic ploy. So you send out like implacable, or you send out um, mutagenic flesh as like, I would like this to go off, but if you want to stop this one, go for it. If you actually want implacable to be um, worked on, basically. So there's a little bit of that. Uh, so I expect to see that play in Kill Team now. Yeah, and one of the things I do like about Absolute Authority is that, you know, it is very high value, but it's also high cost. So it does kind of make that metagame a little bit more thoughtful, which is, you know, you're essentially transferring a command point over um, in exchange for canceling that ploy, which that is a really high cost for just, you know, removing a couple of ballistic skill modifiers inside of something like a legionary matchup. So I do think, you know, it's going to start causing people who have still been playing with just here are the three ploys I'm using this turn instead of going in that back and forth sequence to really start thinking about what order they're doing things in, which I love. Yeah. It's just it's just strategic ploys, isn't it? I because it's a strategic. Ploy. It's a tactic tactical as well. It's a tactical ploy that you can use on any ploy, if I remember correctly. I can, um, I'll double check. It... Yes, that is correct. Right, right. Yeah. That's, yeah, absolute it's... authority is a uh, tactical ploy. So another thing that I think players um, can play against. So I know Inquisition has a lot of uh, a lot of plasma gunners and medics. They have a lot of options. 
But one of the things that you get is you get to tax them on their CP spend. So having come from Crew and Star Striders, these teams are teams that burn through their CP. And then generally by turn three or turn four, you're, you're really scraping by for things that you really need to prioritize. Um, for Crew, it might be like a last minute poach that now you have no other rerolls for. For Commandos, it might be a just a scratch. So mm-hmm. getting that refund back of your strat ploy or your attack ploy, just know that in the later phases of the game, use more of your ploys to basically uh, rubber band that advantage back. Or if you get just a scratch countered for absolute authority, now line up for a crumpum instead, because now your opponent has to deal with more stuff. They gave you CP, they don't get a reroll, and for Inquisition, they really don't have access to a lot of rerolls. Most of the models hit on fours, so your goal is to be able to apply your better stat sheets after they've spent the CP. Because if they do absolute 40 four turns or four turns in a row they have three cp left over uh to spend for the rest of the game because you have seven base uh, unless the inquisition agent somehow manages to uh scribe some extra cp into their coffers which is possible on that team um so if you get just a scratch countered line up for a crump them where you know you get a fight at the end of the turn if you're uh, if your implacable gets countered, line up so that you can take a uh, Veterans of the Long War shot, where if you miss, you still have a good uh, second rewind. Things like that are probably going to be the counterplay for the Inquisition, not just uh, being sad that you lost a ploy. Because remember, <laughs> at the end of the day, it's all about player skill. Well, hang on a minute. What about your Phobos? If you, uh, if you got Vanguard taken away from you, would you what would you do? Uh, luckily for Phobos, they do have a really good side strategy to managing seven wound models with five up saves. And it's to mm-hmm. take five reavers and just charge your opponent. Yeah. yeah. What happens... Uh, sorry, I should actually know the answer to this before I bring it up, but Absolute Authority into uh, a Sneaky Get. What do you mean? Can Absolute Authority cancel Sneaky Get and yeah. all other uses of it? Uh, it would get it would get countered once, and then you could counter it. You well, Absolute Authority says you can't point. use that play. Uh, no, I think you... So the way I would rule it, because Absolute Authority and Sneaky Get can both be used outside of phase, uh, yeah. it's not a turning point, so yeah. there's no point in doing it, because you can't stop Sneaky Get. Do counterspell and then they just do it again because <laughs> it's not a turning point. Okay, work. Yeah. Oh, actually, no. It specifically says you can't even use this tech ploy outside of the battle, so you absolutely cannot do it. You must be on the Neat. table for the authority to sit. So it says right at the end. Note that you cannot use this tech ploy outside of the battle. Okay, I just delete all of that the scouting then phase. It's just so. not right. Yeah. So luckily, that audio strictly cut. things that happen on the board. Um, so just make sure that you look at all of your ploys. I know a lot of people have like a handful of ploys they always use, but there's lots of power embedded in other parts of the ploy. For Phobos, it would be making sure that you get stealth assaults if you don't get your Vanguard, so that when you charge, you take no damage so that your Reaver can do another fight. Um, maybe it would be Vanguard gets countered, so now you get double fight or you take double shoot and you just get very loud and kill as many models as possible, which is definitely a thing that I would be aiming to do against Inquisition agents on open. Because while they are large, they have a large team, all of your guns are still kind of scary. So Bolter Discipline is definitely a thing. Maybe the P1 gets used if you're Phobos against Inquisition, just to really guarantee that you get a couple shots. Stuff like that. Yes, all very good things. Cool. Well, I think that about covers it for today's episode. Um, I want to say thanks again for both of you coming on. Um, any final shout outs? Anything that you want to touch on before we head out? Yeah, definitely. Everybody, get your tickets for the New York Open 2023, November 4th and 5th, right in the center of New York City. It's going to be amazing. Last year was incredible. It's just going to be better this year. Uh, You can come and and meet all of us and have an amazing time. Uh, I I recommend it. (laughs) Um, Tickets are out soon. I'll see you all there. Well, we have uh, narrative tickets on their way. We're working on something special in the background, but the GT will be up when this podcast comes out. Thanks again for listening, everyone. It was uh, great having you. Thanks again, Rose.